Greetings, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here again, offering up another pearl of wisdom, especially for you, taken from the annals of Chinese history. After a longer-than-expected break, we are back, and we're right in the middle of the Tang Dynasty. To recap from where we were last time, Li Yuan seized power from the Sui rulers in 617. The Yangs of the Sui didn't have the mandate of heaven for too long. The next year, Li Yuan establishes the Tang Dynasty with the help of his sons, most notably Li Shermin, who later on forces his father from the throne and then goes on to rule as Tang Taizong from 626 to 648, a golden age in China. He dies, and it's a big mess, but his son Li Jie is put on the throne and reigns as Emperor Gaozong. Gaozong was a weak and later a physically feeble emperor. He didn't have too much in common with his great father, the late Emperor Taizong. They were different in almost every way, but not in the choice of their concubines. The late Emperor Taizong's concubine now belonged to the son, Gaozong. And this concubine, of course, was none other than Wu Zetian. We looked at her amazing eight decades on this planet last time when I rebroadcasted the Wu Zetian episode presented earlier this year. And so we pick up today in 705 AD. We're not quite, but almost at the halfway point of the Tang Dynasty. The incredible and fruitful reign of Taizong, considered to be the greatest or one of the greatest emperors of China, is going to be eclipsed in greatness and glory during this podcast episode when we get to the Emperor Xuanzong, better known as Emperor Ming. This was the great-grandson of Taizong. To set the stage, Wu Zetian during her last years was hardly the sharpest knife in the drawer anymore. She takes two boy toys into her confidence. They were the, the half-brothers surnamed Zhang. They notoriously took advantage of Wu Zetian and her aged condition and shocked the imperial court with their scandalous behavior and involvement in palace politics due to the control and influence they exercised over Wu Zetian. They were with her constantly and derived all their power from the old empress. It got so bad with these two that there was a palace revolt and both Zhang brothers were killed and Wu Zetian was removed from power completely in 705 and she died the same year in December. Now there's somewhat of a power vacuum at the top. The next seven years, sort of dicey. There's no strong man within the Li family, so all the various branches of the family are now making moves against one another, and all kinds of nasty stuff is going on in the background. Wu Zetian's son was now on the throne, reigning as Emperor Zhongzong. Nothing much to say about the Zhongzong Emperor, except to say his time on Earth was defined by his evil wife, the Empress Wei good old Wei Huang Ho. In the summer of 710, the Zhongzong Emperor dies suddenly and mysteriously, and everyone is convinced it was Empress Wei who did the evil deed. The method of choice back in those days was, of course, poison. What the infamous Queen Messalina was to poor old Roman Emperor Claudius, Empress Wei was to Zhongzong. Both were the facilitators of their emperor husband's demise. It was an open secret that she was stuffing the bureaucracy with all her relatives and favorites and sooner or later was going to make a grab for power a la Wu Zetian. She had a lover, Wu Sansi, who was also an advisor to her husband, the emperor, and also a nephew of Wu Zetian. She and her closest supporters were selling offices and bumping off people at will. She was now ruling as Empress Dowager. Now enter our hero, Li Longji. Li Longji was a prince, the son of the now-deceased Zhongzong Emperor. He was smart, capable, and had success and ability written all over him. He was born in 685, which by my mathematical calculations made him 25 years old when all this heavy stuff was going down. He conspired with his closest political allies at court to strike first before Empress Wei and her faction seized absolute power. Indeed, there was something going on with the Empress Dowager, but her evil plans were leaked to Li Longji, and on July 21st, 710, Li Longji and his fellow conspirators strike first. Empress Wei makes a desperate attempt to escape, but she is beheaded by one of the palace guard, and the inevitable bloodbath ensues, where Empress Wei's faction were all decimated. 
Empress Wei ended up with her head on a stick displayed for public viewing along with her decapitated body, and for good measure was posthumously demoted to commoner status. Emperor Ruizong is put on the throne again. If you remember, he was put on the throne initially by his mother, Wu Zetian, back when the Gaozong Emperor died, but then was later removed. Well, now he's back, and Li Longqi is named the crown prince. Rui Zong retired in 712 after a two-year breather from all the madness that had just transpired, and Li Longqi becomes emperor on September 8th after outmaneuvering the Rui Zong emperor's two sons, who arguably had more legitimacy than Li Longqi. He lasts a long time, Li Longqi does, uh, reigning as the Xuanzong Emperor from 712 to 756, just a tad under 44 years. It's under this emperor, more commonly known as Emperor Ming or Tang Ming Huang, that the Tang Dynasty truly peaks in all its greatness and glory. If China was the center of the world under Emperor Taizong, it was even more so under this emperor. After a year of patching things up and assembling the ministers and sorting out who was who under the new regime, you had from 713 to 741 the Kaiyuan era of his reign. I haven't mentioned this yet, but every emperor's reign was given an era name to define that portion of the emperor's reign. I guess when you consider Chinese history and how long it all is, if you ever wonder what were really the best years in Chinese history, well... Here we are in the Tang Dynasty now, which along with the Song is considered China's greatest moment on the world stage, not including today if you want to make that argument, and in the greatest dynasty now we have the greatest emperor, and the 28 years of the Kaiyuan era were the greatest and most fruitful years of his reign. So you could say it was the best years of the best emperor of the best dynasty in China now. If I think of a counterpart in the West of who we could sort of compare the Xuanzong Emperor to, I guess the Habsburg Emperor Joseph II comes to mind, the musical king. That's very much what it was like in the Kaiyuan era, Tang Dynasty China. It was, it was a time when the arts exploded in every direction. The greatest poets, painters, musicians, dancers, and performers of every art you can imagine all thrived during this time. Emperor Ming himself was a competent man of letters as well, and also a musician. He surrounded himself with poets and entertainers. This was the time when not only Li Bai lived, arguably China's greatest poet, but Du Fu as well. And plenty argue today, who was greater, Li Bai or Du Fu? People visited this splendid capital of Chang'an by the thousand. They came by sea, overland, and via the Silk Road whenever it was open. It's now almost eight centuries since the birth of Jesus. The interaction between peoples of different lands is increasing now, and the momentum is really building now as all the great ideas, inventions, arts, fashions, food, spices, animals, and priceless treasures all found their way to Chang'an. A whole enlightenment was going on during this period, and the dynamic of Mixing all these peoples from faraway lands in this setting had a greater impact on man's development than we can ever imagine. The Hanlin Academy, or Hanlin Yuan, was also established. These were the creme de la creme of the elite scholars. Let's say what, uh, say, FIFA is to world soccer, the Hanlin Academy was to the all-important imperial civil service exams. They were sort of the ultimate arbiters of all things Confucian, and the exams, of course, were all pulled from the classics. Believe it or not, the Hanlin Academy lasted all the way up until the last year of the last dynasty in China. Now, in addition to being an extravagant patron of the arts for a very long time and sponsoring this era of unparalleled creativity, the Xuanzong Emperor was also a very capable ruler as well. His rise to power is one of the several princes growing up in a very poisonous environment, and his ultimate victory overcoming all enemies meant he was certainly an extraordinary individual. By all accounts, he was conscientious and an extremely capable administrator, sometimes prone to micromanaging. He purged the bureaucracy of anyone who didn't belong there. This included vestiges of Empress Wei's people and 
anyone else who opposed him during the bad old days, as well as parasites who simply lived off the fat of the system. He cleaned house and government and evidently did a very good job. He picked good ministers who served him well, a few exceptionally well. Court extravagances were initially scaled down, and he kept in touch with the people and showed genuine concern to help avoid any suffering. He abolished capital punishment and continued on the tradition of a very proactive foreign policy. And to top it all off, it was a period of unparalleled general economic prosperity with great advances made in commerce. The Ming emperor couldn't do it all by himself. In the beginning, he had a lot of help from his two main chancellors, or Zai Xiang. Initially, his main advisor was one Yao Chong, who was ably assisted by Lu Huai Shen. The Xuanzong emperor couldn't have had a better or more capable right-hand man than Yao Chong. Yao was 35 years the emperor's senior and had served under Wu Zetian and the two emperors Zhongzong and Zong. He was indispensable during the first few years of Xuanzong's reign and was succeeded upon his retirement by Song Jin. Song was another you know, great one from the Tang period. You know, the emperors, empresses, military heroes, they tend to get all the ink in the textbooks and whatnot, but no less important are the guys behind the scenes who are directing the whole production. We say here in the U.S. that the presidency is more than just one man. Well, so it was in China with the emperor's court. The reign was only as good as the prime ministers and bureaucrats responsible for the whole system. Xuanzong had it good. His first Tu Zai Xiang had plenty of past experience, surfing all the way back to Wu Zetian's time. Things in the palace and throughout the administration and down to all the prefectures, everything ran smoothly, peacefully, and in such a way that you didn't have uprisings or any of these famines or natural disasters that China was so famous for. It was a very stable time, and a lot of this was due to how well things were run from the top down. So, Xuanzong was most fortunate to have Yao Chong and Song Jing managing his show. Then, from 737 to 752, the emperor had Li Linfu as his chancellor. Though harsh and corrupt through and through, the dynasty continued surfing this very nice wave of peace and prosperity with Li Linfu in charge. It said nothing good lasts forever. Well, this sure rang true for the Xuanzong Emperor and the Tang Dynasty in general. As I mentioned before, the dynasty really peaked during Xuanzong's reign. And once uh, Li Linfu dies, this commences a concatenation of events that leads to a big shock to the dynasty. The dynasty never recovers to its former glory, and we still have 150 years to go yet. So now comes one of the great stories from Chinese history. It involves the infamous and notorious concubine Yang Yuhuan, a.k.a. Yang Guifei, of the long and colorful list a mile long of femme fatales from Chinese history. Yang Guifei usually tops the list. She was the fourth of the four great beauties of ancient China, the, the Sida Meinyu. The amazing thing is that this emperor, as we have just learned, was a powerhouse of good governments, culture, good taste, and excellent leadership. Now he's the very significant age in China of 60 years old in 745, and from this point on, the focus of all of his attention went from managing the state to managing his time with the concubine Yang Guifei. This is truly a great love story. The emperor really loved this woman and went through all kinds of stress from his closest advisors who saw what was happening before their eyes. He was simply in love with this woman, and all who surrounded the emperor were looking for every possible excuse or technicality to diminish her and stop what was going on in front of them. It was sort of a, in a way, a John and Yoko kind of a thing. I mean, both were artists, and he, of course, was the emperor, which isn't quite as great as being a beetle, but wasn't too bad nonetheless. The emperor was utterly smitten with her and wanted to do nothing except be with her and watch her dance and recite poetry and play music. And they were this amazing couple, but he took his eye off the ball. You see, the basic problem was that Yang Yuhuan, well, 
Before she was Yang Guifei, she was the wife of the emperor's 18th son, Li Mao. The Xuanzong emperor was in love with her and wanted her for his own, but how to deal with such a sensitive and complicated situation? I mean, what was going to be the best way to get the son to divorce the wife and then take the ex-daughter-in-law as his own concubine? And then after the easy part was done, how to finesse this one past all these stodgy Confucian chancellors and ministers? Well, love always finds a way, and the emperor did a little of this, a little of that, and after some time involving a Yang Yuhuan posing as a Taoist nun for a while, the emperor got his girl, and before long he had her elevated to the level of Gui Fei concubine. In fact, the highest level attainable until this time, according to the Tang Dynasty concubine ranking system, was a Hui Fei but when Yang Yuhuan comes along, a new rank of Gui Fei is created just for her. As for Li Mao, the son, uh, the emperor got him another wife, which uh, was the least he can do, considering. It said the uh, Xuanzong emperor had thousands upon thousands of concubines, more than any other Chinese emperor. But none of them compared to Yang Gui Fei. I mean... They just became inseparable. He had thousands to choose from, but he only chose one. Perhaps this love might have lasted forever, but there was one weak spot, one fly in the ointment. That was a person by the name of Yang Guozhong. Yang Guozhong was a cousin of Yang Guifei, and she used her special relationship with the emperor to get this guy noticed. And Yang Guozhong was one of the great shoe shiners in Chinese history and was notorious about all the ways he fawned all over the emperor and flattered him and oozed all the requisite charm to build up his personal guanxi with the emperor. And, of course, his cousin was there to help his cause by using all her formidable ways. So, without Yang Guifei, there wouldn't have been a Yang Guozhong. I mentioned a little while back uh, that things started to go awry about the time of the Chancellor Li Linfu's death. So Li dies, and rather than pick the front runner uh, and the one who was best for the job, a general up in the north named An Lu Shan, Yang Guifei does all the necessary things to cause the emperor to pick her cousin Yang Guozhong as the new chancellor to replace Li Linfu. Well, whether he was more corrupt than inept or more inept than corrupt was hard to say, but he was pretty bad, and in no time at all, he was rubbing everyone the wrong way, and if this wasn't enough, Yang Guozhong just lived extravagantly and conspicuously. He has a lot of enemies. Now, this An Lu Shan, he was another of uh, Emperor Xuanzong's favorites and had even been made an adopted son of Yang Guifei. And this special relationship allowed him to grow and consolidate his power up in the north. He was a bona fide competitor to Yang Guozhong. In early 754, Yang makes his move against An Lu Shan and whispers some stuff in the emperor's ear to the extent that, uh, you know, An was plotting rebellion. Yang Guozhong was starting to have this, this Rasputin effect on the aging emperor. This rivalry between An and Yang sustained itself until the end of 755, when An, now painted into a corner by Yang's treachery, rose up and marched on Luoyang, capturing it in 756. The emperor fled Chang'an as the rebellion started to pick up steam, and the whole imperial wagon train got about a hundred miles away, and within the entourage, a little mini-revolt springs up, and this particular mutiny was targeted against Yang Guozhong and his creator, Yang Guifei. They got as far as Ma Wei Yi in the old Qing dynasty capital of Xianyang in Shanxi, the imperial soldiers rose up and they killed Yang Guozhong for this whole miserable debacle and for creating the political environment that was forcing them to flee the capital in the first place. Then the climax of this tragedy then goes down and the leaders of this revolt at Ma Wei Yi, Chen Xuan Li, Wei E, Gao Li Shi combined, well, they convinced the emperor he had to do the unthinkable and put his beloved concubine to death for her hand in this Whole disaster. After tearful goodbyes and dramatic parting, Gao Li Shi took the emperor's love, Yang Guifei, to a Buddhist shrine close by, and there, thanks to the emperor's intervention, she was strangled to death using a length of silk rather than the normal method by sword. The love and the 
tragic story of Emperor Xianzong and Yang Guifei was immortalized in the poem by Bai Ju Yi, the Song of Everlasting Sorrow. The opening lines are well known to all who went through the school systems of the Chinese speaking world. Han Huang Zhong Si, Si Qing Guo, Yu Yu Duo Nian Qiu Bu De. China's emperor, yearning for beauty that shakes a kingdom, reigned for many years, searching but not finding. The long poem tells the story of Xuanzong and Yang Guifei until their tragic ending. The tale of Genji, the world's, were considered the world's first novel, was inspired by this story, beloved in Japan as well as in China. The ill-fated Yen dynasty of An Lu Shan consisted of himself and his son and a, a pair of father and son generals. Each one was murdered by their successor. With four assassinations in eight years, no one was able to quite get a grip on the um, mandate of heaven. But the House of Tang was also going through all kinds of drama. The emperor retired in favor of his son, the crown prince Li Heng, who became Emperor Su Zong. Not much to say about this emperor, except to say eunuchs infiltrated the inner sanctums of government and began to assert their legendary control. Other than that, the Su Zong emperor spent his time trying to recapture Chang'an from the Yen Empire and quell the An Lushan Rebellion, which, as I said, wasn't put down until 763 during the reign of the next emperor, Daizong. An Lushan, incidentally, was murdered by his own son in 757. And that was it for the Tang. The capital had been won back as well as the core surroundings of the two capital. They still had another 144 years to go till the last Tang emperor turned out the light. In 763, when the uh, Anshu Rebellion, as it was also called, was finally put down, warlordism had returned in force as all the generals began to settle in for another period of disunity where they might play a leading role. This was going to be the primary cause of the demise of the Tang dynasty. The remaining nine Tang emperors, though many were quite competent, were little more than puppets, and the strongest warlord, whoever it was, was really the true power center in the country. The western lands had all been lost to the Tibetans and Uyghurs. The glory days of Taizong and Xuanzong were gone, and this grand siècle of the Tang Dynasty was never to return. The year 751 was a banner year for the Tang Dynasty, for it was then that the Tang were soundly defeated by a vastly superior army of the Abbasid Caliphate at the Battle of Talas River. This uh, was in present-day Kyrgyzstan. The significance of this battle was that it was the beginning of the end of Chinese influence in Central Asia. And thus, all the people of all the lands known as the Stans, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, all of them, once the Chinese were pushed out, the Abbasids were free to spread Islam in these lands of Turkic peoples, and to this day, Central Asia remains a mostly Muslim land. One other little anecdote from this Battle of Talas, the Arabs were most fortunate in that they captured certain Chinese prisoners, or prisoner, I'm not sure, Anyway, it was from uh, these prisoners who had the magic recipe that the Arabs learned how to make paper. You can imagine the impact this had on Islam and spreading the words of the Prophet. So this battle was in 751, and at this juncture, China had the worldwide monopoly on paper trading. But by the 790s, there's already a paper-making industry in Baghdad, and this uh, was all thanks to the prisoners captured during this battle who had just happened to know this technology. And perhaps they used it to bargain for their lives. The, um, the Tang Dynasty ultimately fell in 907, but we'll look more closely at that when we do the following episode on the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period. After the Battle of Talas and then the whole devastation of the An Lushan Rebellion, people were so tired of all the wars and the conscription that went with it, and you could read the wariness in the poems of Du Fu. Let's just go back and look at some of the great things to come out of the Tang Dynasty. In literature, nothing defined the Tang more than its poets. Of course, you had Li Bai, or Li Bo, as he's also known, and Du Fu. I just mentioned Bai Ju Yi. There were so many others, but the most notable Tang poets uh, remembered today would be uh, Chen Zi Ang, Song Zhi Wen, 
Meng Hao Ran, Wang Changling, Wang Wei, Gao Zhi, Du Mu, Li Shangyin, and uh, Wen Tingyuan. We're going to come back another day and do a podcast devoted solely just to uh, Tang poetry. Xuanzong also had an academy for theater and music set up. This was known as the Pear Garden or the、uh, Li Yuan. It's been called the first music academy ever in the world. In the sciences, This was an extremely fruitful age. There were great advances in astronomy, and medicine. The greatest ancient work of Chinese medicine, the Qian Jin Fang or the Thousand Golden Prescriptions, was written and treasured for this knowledge it contained. It was the time of Yi Xing, a universal man of his time, whose astronomical and mechanical works advanced the understanding of his times. Many. Great scientists, cartographers, chemists, engineers did all kinds of great things during this period. And of course, there was the invention of woodblock printing from the early part of the Tang. The emergence of woodblock printing and the spread of Buddhism sort of went hand in hand. The dissemination of these sutras and charms was so important to the spread of Buddhism. So this was truly a great breakthrough. And of course, the Impact it had on literature and popular literature can't be underestimated. So much brilliant talent was walking around the streets of Chang'an, and woodblock printing allowed their words to be printed and read rather than only listened to at a tea house or on a street corner. I think we're going to put the brakes on right here and call it a day. Next week we'll quickly look at the end of the Tang and another of China's classic periods of disunity, known as the. Five dynasties and ten kingdoms, and like I said, it only lasted seventy-two years or so. So you can imagine what it's going to be like. And so, at last, better late than never. This is Laszlo Montgomery wishing you the fondest of farewells from a very、uh, cold Claremont, California. Yes, going down to one degree Celsius tonight. Quite a frigid winter this one, isn't it? Sorry for the long delay, everyone, due to my Christmas case of、uh, acute viral rhinopharyngitis. I'm almost fully recovered, as you could hear, and、uh, working full speed now on the next episode, which is almost finished. I hope everyone listening had a happy holiday season. I'm wishing everyone around the world, wherever you are, the best of health and happiness. May 2011 bring only good and great things to all of you. Take care, everyone.